welcome to the BBC School Report from KC Arbor Academy. I'm Alex. And I'm Jenny. And we're here today to bring you the breaking news from KSTER and also some national and international issues. And first, we bring you international news from Israel, where President Obama is visiting for the first time since his first presidential election. Thank you, Harry. We now give an insight into the new budget revealed by George Osborne, the Chancellor. Today we are reporting about the budget cuts which are affecting both England and Wales. Earlier this morning, the Chancellor, George Osborne, was interviewed about this matter. He said he is facing the financial problems instead of running away from them like other countries with financial issues. He explained that petrol would now be 13 pence a litre cheaper than it would have been if the fuel duty had carried on increasing. That was only one of the headline-grabbing initiatives that the Chancellor announced. Others were... Cutting the price of beer by one pence a pint from this Sunday. Taking 2.7 million people off the income tax by raising the threshold to £10,000 in April next year. Providing a £3.5 billion of help to buy government loans to meet 20% of the cost of buying a new property and also guaranteeing 20% of a mortgage on any home to support £130 billion of lending. Cutting £2,000 off the national insurance bill of every company. A £3 billion a year boost to infrastructure projects from 2015 to 2016. These initiatives that the Chancellor and his allies announced can help the unemployed families and the employed families earning a small wage. That's it from us today. Back to Alex and Jenny in the studio. Hi, I'm Harry and I'm from BBC School Report. I'm bringing you the latest international headlines. First on our agenda is Barack Obama's very first visit to Israel. I'm here with our World Affairs correspondent, Alex. Good afternoon. So, what is Barack Obama actually negotiating with Israel? Well, he has flown over, as you know, to Israel to talk about joining forces with Israel and America to create a more defined policy against Iran's nuclear development. Thank you, Jade and Danny. Now on to some local news. The first report we bring you is on the case the Heritage Centre. Hello, I'm Rhys, reporting for Case de Arbor Academy. We're reporting to you today from the Case de Heritage Centre to tell you the impact that the Heritage Centre has had on Case de. In the Heritage Centre we have our reporter, Jenny. Hi, I'm Jenny. I'm here with... Um, in the Case Star Arts and Heritage Centre, and we're here to find out more about the impact of the Heritage Centre on the community. So, what do you think people in Case Star have really appreciated about the opening of the Heritage Centre? Well, it's, it's, it's a nice place to come to. Um, it's, it's a community home, really, and it's the first time Case has had a, a, a building like this where people can come have a coffee and then come to the library. Time. Okay. Do you think since the Heritage Centre has opened, you've had more customers and more work, and do you think it's expanded in a good way? And do you oh, think yes. it will expand into the future? Hope so. Hope so. We should be all very um, devastated if if it doesn't. But yes, it's, it's built up um, quite slowly and. Uh, we have peaks and troughs. Uh, we have uh, display boxes in the library with artefacts and objects in. Uh, and as we have new objects brought in to us, then we will display them and find out a bit more about them. Such like this coin that was recently found. Um, it's an Anglo-Saxon coin. Uh, it was minted between 802 and 839. Um, so it's really very old, over a thousand years old. And this was brought in um, by a member of the public and we find out about it for them. Yeah. Now we're in the cafe with Gaynor, who used to volunteer here but now works here. Do you enjoy working in the cafe where you get to experience the community talks? Oh, very much so. It's, it's not really like a job, it's an absolute bonus every day. Um, you get to meet new people from all over the Lincolnshire walls and, and further afield. Well, um, and it's, uh, you know it's a job. Yeah. What, what I is um, Is it good to be involved with other Do you like talking to the people in the community and finding out what they like about it? 
Oh, absolutely. And I encourage them as well, as all the other members of volunteers or people who work here, we all encourage them to tell us what they like, what they'd like to see on here, what we can do better, um, what we're not doing right. Yeah, it's, it's all very much part of, a, we'd say, a, a big family. Yeah. So what do, what do the like, customers who come here, what do they think the best facility is? Um, hard to say, there's so many facilities here now, from the heritage side, which is growing all the time, people who come see the exhibitions uh, and the art from the local um, artists that people find. It, there's so much that goes on here. The, the project now of Case Stories, which is getting a lot of people involved here. Um, it's not just about coming no, in the cafe and having a, a coffee, cake and a chat. There's so much more on everybody. The Case for Running Club has been around for two years now and these strong men and women are up and running at half past eight on a Saturday morning or at 7.30pm on Tuesday or Thursday. They now have 97 members, which for a small town is amazing. Josh and Alex will be interviewing some of their members and Harry will be interviewing the founder. Hi, my name's Alex. And I'm Josh. And we're here today from Case the Arbor Academy filming for BBC School Report at William Woods to interview some of the Case to Running Club members. What makes you run with others instead of by yourselves? Well, I used to run on myself uh, on my own, but I didn't, I didn't know about the, uh, the club until well, about a year after it started. So yeah. that was about a year and a half ago I started running. It's just it's more motivational, it gets you out in the bad weather like today. So, uh, you know, it's so easy when you're on your own to just sort of sit there and think, okay, I'm staying in the hall. But you've got an excuse to uh, to uh, get out there and do it together, so it's good fun. Yeah, and, and did you do the 10k? Uh, what, the one at Caster? Yeah. Yeah, I did that last year for the first time, that was great fun. Yeah. What time did you get in that curve? Oh, well, I, I don't know, 50, 56, yeah. 55, 56 <laughs> minutes, something like that. Yeah, it's sort a of. Tough um, one, it's, but it's, it's, a good it's really one. good, good fun, very Sorry. hard. <laughs> Sorry, 45 minutes. <laughs> I think, I think it helps around here, countryside's actually quite pretty, um, it's, it's rolling or it can be quite hilly and you That's get the opportunity point. to get, get out. Cause... So, you up for this Josh? I'm not sure, are you? 14 to 15 miles, so, sounds good. Hi, I'm Harry and I'm here with Chris Roby, I'm interviewing on behalf of the Caston Running Club. Thank you, pleasure to be here Harry. Thank you. So, Chris, when did the, what, this idea start? When did the running club? Well, uh, it, it was around about two years ago. Um, but I'd been running for about ten years on my own, always on my own, training for kind of all different events, races, half marathons, marathons, uh, but always on my own. And I always saw a lot of pe other people out running. And so it just came to me that I was getting a bit bored and fed up, and maybe we could set up a running club. So that's also what inspired you to start this thing? Yeah, I think so. Um, can, we, can you tell us more information on your new eight-week starting um, And this shows you the plan. Um, basically, it's, it runs for eight weeks, and uh, someone can arrive with no fitness whatsoever, and we take them through a process, uh, and during the course of the eight weeks, we gradually step up the running. It's a combination of running walking and we gradually ease off on the walking and build up the running during the course of the eight weeks. And like I say, last year we had 25 people took part, um, over 20 of them concluded it. Many of them have gone on to run 10k races and half marathons um, since then. I don't think we've had anyone yet who's done a marathon. Um, um, and it's all from a standing start. And uh, as I say, it starts tonight in case to at the Small Sensation Club. Charlotte and the recent landslide in Doncaster and the effect it has had on the community. Hello, we are from Case Arbor. My name is Charlotte and I am Jade. 
We are intrigued about the landslip that took place in Doncaster. Trains services between Doncaster and Scunthorpe were disrupted by a landslide. The disruptions were caused after a spoil heap collapsed on a track near Stainforth. This took place in February. We had the privilege of talking to the Mayor of Stainforth and this is what she had to say. Can you actually describe what the pit tip is to our viewers and what has actually happened there recently? Uh, what's happened recently is at Stainforth in near Doncaster we have had a, a landslip at the Hatfield Main Colliery. Um, the lines between Doncaster and Goal and Doncaster and Hull are all shut down. Uh, there's nothing working whatsoever. Uh, it's been one of the worst landslips in history, um, the saying, and it's going to take a very, um, the very high and the close to a vicinity of a school and houses. Okay. Um, will it affect the area economically? Economically, it's, uh, as you know, it's a, a mining village. It's um, located seven miles to Lancaster. Uh, it's, a, it's not a very... You no, know, poverty is very high in this area. You know, there's very low work available for people around there. Uh, they're all very concerned. Everything, you know, there was quite a lot to worry around the village at the moment. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you. Do you think this will be a good opportunity to publicise the area? Uh, oh, it, it doesn't matter what's happening. It's the publicity at the moment, we've got a lot of publicity and this is what we need to try so people can help us. We really need publicity and at the moment we're getting publicity from papers, the news, the television, you know, so it's really good to have publicity. The more publicity you can get, the better it is for, for our cause. Mm. Um, like this. Okay. Um... How are people getting to and from the area with the trains being put on hold with the situation? Well, as you know, with the uh, rail track has put buses on, so people are having to go on buses, which is making the journey to and from work a lot longer than what it would be by train. Many people have to go to work, some children have to go to school on, what used to go on the train, they have to now travel on a bus, which is making it longer for them, and it's a longer day all over. Oh, um, thank you for your time. No, thank you. Now a report from Neve and Josh about the young sports people in our area. From the arena to the swimming pool, 50-year-old Caitlin from the local grammar school is also competing high in her sport. Hello, I'm here with Caitlin today to interview her about her swimming career. How long have you been into swimming? Uh, since I started swimming when I was three, but competitively since I was eight. How many hours do you train? Um, I used to train 18, but I've cut back to five days a week for an hour and a half each session. Have there been any downsides to your career so far? Well, I hit a bit of a problem the past year because I had a problem with my knee that I had to have two operations on at two different times. So one affected the first time I went to nationals and the second was just before the second time I went to nationals, which was really unfortunate because it meant that I couldn't swim my best when I got there. What's your favourite stroke? Um, my favourite's probably breaststroke because it's the one that I'm best at. How do you balance school life and swimming? Um, uh, it's quite difficult because of the amount of commitment that you have to put in. Would you recommend swimming as a sport? I would recommend swimming as a sport because it leaves you very physically fit. For example, I'm able to run a cross-country race with school without doing any training for it. Thank you for sharing your achievements with us, Caitlin, um, and we hope we'll be hearing from you in the future. This is Jane signing off for BBC School Report at Casey Arbor Academy. Jamie Carter, a former student from Casey Arbor Academy, has a once-in-a-lifetime experience of competing in last year's home olympics with some of the best paralympic athletes from around the world. Hi, my name is Neve and I'm a part of the BBC School News Report. I'm joined here by Jamie Carter. I'd like to say first well done for your achievements with London 2012. How was the experience of the in It's very nerve wracking and I've never done anything like that before. So I just had to take it as it come and just take the experience in. Hopefully next time. Did you expect to do as well as you did? I 
didn't expect to be selected in the first place, so to make the final as well was such a big achievement. How did it feel? Um, I don't know. My aims for the games was make a final and set a PB, and I did that, so I was happy. Hi, I'm Kyle and I'm joined by Jamie Carter's sister Emily. What was your initial reaction to Jamie getting into London 2012 Paralympic Games? Obviously um, I was really happy, uh, so yeah, just really happy. How did he actually get into this sport? Um, he went down to a camp at Stoke Mandeville and he got into three different sports but wheelchair racing was the one he liked best. Has he made any sacrifices on the way? Um, his social life, he doesn't really have one anymore because um, he's just training and he's always at college, just working. What is the next stage for Jamie and what are you supporting him through? Um, he's got the World Championships, hopefully, in 2014. Um, and then we're just concentrating on the Europeans, I think. How has life um, changed? Just the World Championships and then we'll just carry on until 2016 in the year. How has life changed? We're okay. We're strong enough. Um, a family life forward to Rio. Die, we're okay. We're strong enough to cope for it. Thank you very much. And are you looking forward to Rio? I can't wait for Rio. It'll be a good party. Thank you very much. Meanwhile, in school, student Ryan from Year 11 is competing for Great Britain at Judo Championships around the country. At just 14, he won bronze at the under 90 kg category in Sheffield. Hi, I'm here with Ryan, and he does judo as a sport. Why did you choose this sport, Ryan? Because it's fun and keeps you fit. How did you get into it? My brother and sister started going, so I thought well, I'd go along as well. What benefits do you get out of doing it? Keeps you fit. And something to do instead of sitting at home all the time. How long have you been doing judo? Twelve years. What, what is the atmosphere when you are competing? Uh, it can be loud at times, but sometimes it's quite quiet, it depends what type of competition it is. How much time do you commit? No, I usually do four hours a week. What sacrifices have you made? Um, I don't really get much time with friends, and time to do schoolwork, well, that's about it. When is your next competition? Um, it's September. Where will it be? In Birmingham. What for? Heart of England. Thank you, Ryan, for answering those questions. I was on Red Nose Day, brought to you by From Case to Primary by Abby and Bryony. Red Nose Day is a huge event around the world, raising millions of pounds each year for deserving charities. I'm Bryony. And I'm Abby. And we're with Mabina. I'm Moise. What have you done so far? Well, this morning when we came into school, we got all the children who brought cakes for a competition, and they're all set it out. And then we had maths, and now we're doing fun stuff instead of boring old school work. Like, if you are you having fun? Yeah. Now we're here to interview some staff. Hi, I'm Miss Heath, and I teach year two. 
Um, hello, my name is Mr Jacqueline and I teach year 4 five. What are you going to be doing for the rest of New Year's Day? Uh, well, we've got the cake sale this afternoon. Cake, well, there's the, yeah, there's the cake sale yeah. this afternoon, there's the competition. And there's the competition, place. yeah, they've done the competition as well. Lots yeah. of children have brought in lots of different cakes. And Thank you for your time. Thank you, and that's all. We're going to interview the head teacher of um, Case to Primary. Do you usually do something different to what you've done this year? Yeah, before we've, we've dressed up in pyjamas. Um, we, I think last year we just had a dressing up day and children brought in a pound donation. This year the event managed to raise in excess of £75 million. What a staggering amount! Some of the highlights of this year's events have included the infamous Jessie J shaving her hair off, One Direction reaching number one with the hit One Way or Another, and Anthony Cotton winning Let's Dance for Comic Relief. And finally, a very important report on the increase in cost and decrease in size of Freddo chocolate bars. We bring you breaking news, the Freddo frog. What once was a cheap luxury tree, but over the years it has gone from 10p to 20p. Found in Australia in the 1930s, manufactured by Cadbury's and brought to England for young kids to enjoy. This small bar of chocolate only weighs 18 grams, but a bar weighing 150 grams, just a pound. We need a crack down on the cost of the Freddo frog. Three, two, one. Freddo! That's it from us. Thank you for watching. And good night. Thank you for your time. Thank you. That's everything. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks.